This episode is brought to you by my 10-week Fertility Awareness Mastery Group Program. If you're listening in real time, registration for my January 2018 groups is now open. To reserve your spot today, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash group program. That's fertilityfriday.com slash group program. This is the Fertility Friday podcast, episode number 172. Welcome to the 172nd episode of the Fertility Friday podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com, and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I'm really excited to share today's episode with you. I'm actually welcoming back one of my very first guests to the show. So in today's episode, I'm welcoming back Sally Fallon Morrell. So for my diehard listeners who have been with me for the past three years, you know who you are, (laughs) who've listened to almost every episode, you'll know that the episode that I recorded with Sally, that was episode number nine. It was one of my very, very first episodes. And it's so interesting (laughs) from my perspective to think back to how nervous I was when I first interviewed Sally, because I I just didn't have as much experience doing interviews. Uh, But she was so gracious and still is one of my most downloaded episodes. And it's also one of my most recommended episodes to listen. Uh, So if you haven't, you know, gone back in the archives and listened to the very first episode I recorded with Stalin Morrell of the Western Price Foundation, I would definitely encourage you to do so. In that episode, we talked about nutrition. So we talked about nutrition for fertility, nutrition for pregnancy, and also postpartum nutrition we got into a little bit. And so um, that's one of the reasons why it's it's one of the most downloaded episodes, but also one of my most recommended episodes, one of the re- episodes that I recommend uh, most regularly. And so in today's episode, we're actually talking about Sally's newest book, which is Nourishing Fats, Why We Need Animal Fats for Health and Happiness. And so, uh, you know, for those of you who've listened to the podcast for a while, you know that I'm always talking about fat. And it's a very, very important conversation to have, especially given the nature of the podcast. So we're always talking about fertility, ways to improve fertility, improve menstrual cycle health, prepare for pregnancy, and to be really, really intentional about building that those nutrients stores going into pregnancy, nourishing the body throughout pregnancy, and then also in the postpartum phase. And a a big part of that, whether we're talking about improving fertility, whether we're talking about preparing for pregnancy during pregnancy or post-pregnancy, is making sure that you're getting enough nourishing fats. And so for those of you who are in the process of learning to chart your cycles, for those of you who have experience charting your cycles, if you are in that pre-pregnancy phase, if you've been trying to conceive for quite some time, or if you're planning to conceive at some point in the future, and you're really wanting that additional layer of support to have somebody look at your charts and help you identify if there's any areas that you should be focusing on, or if you've noticed that there's certain aspects of your chart that you know are off, but you're wanting to have that additional support in helping you to address those and really start to uh, make some positive changes, I want to invite you to jump in and join my 10-week Fertility Awareness Mastery group program. And so registration is still open at the time uh, that this recording is being released. And we are starting, you know, first thing in January 2018. And so I'm securing uh, all my registrants and getting that all sorted out uh, mid-December so that we can really start strong for January. I would love to have you in the group. Make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash group program and apply today to reserve your spot. There's only a limited number of spaces available in the group. And so, and once we start, um, registration is closed until the next offering. So this is a program that I only offer a few times a year. And if you're thinking about being, you know, jumping in and joining the group, you won't regret your decision to join us. All of the women who have come through the program, I've just received the the greatest feedback from them. It's truly just a unique opportunity. So again, for more information, just head over to fertilityfriday.com slash group program. And without further ado, let's jump into today's episode with Sally Fallon Rowe. And today I'm very excited to welcome my guest Sally Fallon Morrell back to the show. In case you haven't heard our first episode, Sally was actually one of the first guests I had on the podcast back in episode nine. So make sure to go back and take a listen to that episode. 
And, and in case you don't know Sally, Sally Fallon Morrell is the founding president of the Weston A. Price Foundation and author of the best-selling cookbook, Nourishing Traditions. Her other titles include the Nourishing Traditions book of baby and child care, Nourishing Broths, and her newest book, Nourishing Fats. And in today's interview, we're going to be talking about fats. We're going to be talking about the importance of animal fats for fertility, pregnancy, and health in general. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Sally. Thank you. Thanks for having me again. Oh, thank you so much for being here. It's honestly one of the most highly downloaded episodes of the show. I mean, oh, really? part oh, of good. it is because it's one of the first, <laughs> so it's <laughs> at the longest time. But it's also an episode that I often refer my clients to, and I often um, refer to when I speak just in general about fats and, and nutrient-dense foods and everything on the podcast. So I'm really excited okay. to have you back. So I guess just to, to start, I would love to hear about basically your process. What drove you to write your newest book, Nourishing Fats? Oh, okay. Well, you know, the universe at work, I think. Uh, I was approached a few years ago to write Nourishing Broth by a New York agent. You know, I never thought that would happen, but her life had been saved by broth, which she read about in Nourishing Traditions, and she thought it was a good idea to have a book on the subject. So, we did that book, and then she said, now you know, Sally, we need to go right back to the publisher with a new proposal while the strike while the iron is hot. So I'd had this idea for many years. In fact, way back in the year 2000, Mary Ennig and I had talked about doing a book on fats, and I actually wrote down an outline for the book. And of course, that was set aside. Many things came in between and intervened. But I thought, well, here is my chance to, to write this, this book finally and even get paid for it. So, <laughs> you know, I have a very popular talk called The Oiling of America, which was based on Mary Ennig's story of what happened to her when she tried to warn people about trans fats. Mm. And that's a part of her message. The trans fats were really bad. But the second part of her message was the saturated fats are good and they do the opposite of the trans fats. Everything they do in the body is good. And that's a very radical message today. So we, the book starts off with basically putting the oiling of America to paper and then goes into all, many different subjects about fats, but ends with a chapter on butter, <laughs> and why butter is the most important fat to have in our diets. Well, I'm holding your book. Um, <laughs> and I'll be referring to it uh, throughout our interview. But I think it's such an important read. Not only do you go through the history, which I find fascinating, and that's what you're talking about, the oiling of America, I'm guessing the first chapter with the, the history yes. and how yes. we used to eat one way and now we eat a completely different way. And that's, that's the result right. of the, the and, <laughs> industry. And you, and, you know, people talk about sugar and high fructose corn syrup and additives and MSG and all these awful things in our food, and they are awful. But really the worst thing is the change in the types of fats that we use. So in 1900, we used animal fats, and we used a lot of them. America, America was a very fertile country, and people could use these fats. Nobody thought there was anything wrong with it. And so we did. We cooked in lard. We ate lots of butter. And we fried our food in tallow. Uh, we used duck fat, goose fat, all those great fats. And today, the use of these fats is minimal. And the great bulk of our fat calories comes from industrially processed oils, seed oils. And Mary Ennig often said to me, you know, this is the number one change that is killing us much more than sugar or additives. And uh, she likened it to the lead pipes in Roman times. You know, people don't even know that there, there's been this change, really. They're not aware of it. But slowly, over several generations, it's leading to infertility. Well, can I, <clears throat> can I read a little section? Because I know when I was reading this, I just want to kind of jump right into it. Where okay. you share this 1985 cookbook, I wish I could see it. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we've just put it on our website. We okay. scanned it in, and it's on the Weston A. Price Foundation website now. I'm going to link to that, and I'm actually going to go after her call and look at it. So I'll just read a real quick excerpt here. So it says, um, the 1985 ba Baptist Ladies Cookbook, 
um, gives us a good idea of basically the collections of recipes. And so what you say is, there's hardly a recipe in this book that does not contain butter, eggs, cream, or lard, beginning with the soup chapter and ending with the large collection of desserts. And you basically go through and describe a couple of dishes and it's all bacon drippings and everything. Lean roasts yes. were larded to make them tender, injected with bits of pig. Like it's to read that. I'll, first of all, it sounds really delicious. Yeah, that's right. But second of all, so completely different to the way we eat. I would love to start there and just to have you share you know right. what that is like then compared to what typical Americans and Canadians and you know North Americans yes. are eating now. Well, I think it's very a uh, really good place to start is the African American community because um, the friends of mine who remember how their grandmothers cook tell me first of all they they ate biscuits in the South. You could not do the sourdough bread; it was too hot, too warm, and so people did biscuits, which is flour raised with baking soda. And lard was used in those biscuits, nothing else, it was lard. Uh, everything was cooked in lard. And then the fat was butter or cream or whole milk. People didn't think otherwise. Skim milk tasted terrible. It was only uh, suitable for giving to pigs, basically. So, so that's how people ate. And, you know, we had, um, you know, whatever your race, that, that's how people ate. If you were Chinese, you were cooking in pig fat. Um, you know, if you were of European ancestry, you cooked in pig fat, uh, you ate lard, and you used lots of butter. So in 1900, except for pockets of extreme poverty, uh, America was a healthy nation, and this continued right up to the Second World War. You know, the American soldiers in Europe, the Europeans thought they looked like gods. They were so handsome and healthy. They had beautiful teeth. Um, this was the result of several generations on a really good diet in America. The other fat that Americans got right up to the Second World War was cod liver oil. And not just European Americans, but African Americans as well. Everyone got cod liver oil. They even gave it to you in Sunday school. <laughs> <laughs> so they were getting the good, stable, saturated fats, plus they were getting their cod liver oil with vitamins A and D. You know, we really had a good diet. Uh, certainly in the early century, early decades of the 1900s, we did. Well, and so then that begs the question, you know, what happened because just to describe like I love that section of it's chapter three where you kind of basically describe what was normal cooking habits and just what ingredients were used if you were to just describe that to your average person today they would believe that that is a recipe for heart disease cancer and death exactly oh and by the way another really interesting thing is to go to the joy of cooking and uh, an old joy of cooking you know, the old blue one light blue one and there's a page about meat and it shows all the different cuts of meat and they're all wrapped in fat that's what the butcher did for you he wrapped <laughs> the meat in fat otherwise it was inedible huh. so so yeah i mean people knew that they should eat the meat with fat because it tasted good they and so forth well what happened so you had a waste product called cotton seed oil in the south the south there was a lot of cotton raised and you had all these seeds left over, and they figured out how to take out the cottonseed oil, how to harden it by an industrial process so it could be used for candles. And Procter & Gamble was a company that made candles and soap, and they were using this partially hydrogenated cottonseed oil. Electricity came along and starting in the 1880s, and so there was no market for candles anymore. <laughs> so they had to figure out what to do with all this cottonseed oil. And they thought, well, why don't we sell it as a food? That would get people to eat it instead. <laughs> and so this big marketing campaign started to make people think that it was vulgar to use lard and we should feel guilty to use butter. And that um, the partially hydrogenated cottonseed oil, which they called Crisco, was what we should be using because it was cleaner, it was more modern, more scientific. One of the arguments they used is that it was easier to digest, that if you cooked in Crisco, your house would smell better. They really appealed to 
the up-and-coming American middle class who wanted clean houses and, you know, cleanliness. Cleanliness was a big, big thing in those days. So they said, this is cleaner. It doesn't smoke. Your house won't smell bad. And you're, and then they also appealed to the desire for their children to be successful. And they said, if you use Crisco instead of lard, your children will have better characters. Wow. <laughs> I kid you not. Yeah. It was a full court press advertising campaign. They had these little recipe books. They had advertisements in the ladies' magazine saying, ask your grocer to stock Crisco, coming to a grocery store soon. And that's how they did it. Now, that the early days. They just sort of implied that this was more scientific, cleaner. They really didn't say it was healthier. They just said it was cleaner. But Americans uh, were very interested in health. And so what they did then was get in league with some scientists who could be bought. And they started to demonize their competition, which was butter and lard, by saying that butter and lard had cholesterol in them. And you didn't want to have this cholesterol in the fats you were using. And so you had this cholesterol-free Crisco, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started. And as people were using more Crisco, more vegetable oils, heart disease was increasing. There was a lot of attention to this. So what they did was they <laughs> blamed the increase in heart disease, not on themselves, which they should have, but on the fats that people were not eating so much of anymore. Well, let's talk a little bit about cholesterol. What is cholesterol for those of us who just may not be familiar? And <laughs> I guess the million dollar question is, you know, is cholesterol bad for us? Yeah, right. Okay. Cholesterol is not a fat. It's often called a fat, but it's not a fat. It doesn't dissolve in water, so it's not water soluble. So in that sense, it acts like a fat. It's more like a wax. And it's a sterol. It's got the four ring structure of a sterol. And it's got the word sterol in it, cholesterol. And cholesterol is found uniquely in animal foods. It's not in vegetable foods, plant foods, grains, or anything else. It's in, uniquely in animal foods. And so they started to say that this was bad. In heart disease, you saw this plaque in the arteries, and there was some cholesterol in the plaque. They blamed the plaque on cholesterol. What they didn't tell you was all the important roles of cholesterol in the body. So first and foremost, cholesterol is in every cell in the membrane around the cell. And without cholesterol, your cells would not be waterproof and you couldn't have a different chemistry on the inside and the outside of the cell. So cholesterol is 100% essential for life, just for that reason alone. Uh, the other very important role of cholesterol is that we make hormones out of cholesterol. So we make testosterone, um, estrogen, progesterone, DHEA, all these hormones are made out of cholesterol. The body takes the cholesterol, makes a few little changes to it, and then you have all these various hormones. I think people would be interested to know that if you lower your cholesterol, you might not be able to make testosterone or estrogen. I think men would be very interested to know that. And then there's another whole set of hormones that we use for regulation of the body. So it regulates blood pressure, blood sugar, helps us absorb minerals, helps us deal with stress, you know, maintain uh, homeostasis in many ways. And these are also all made out of cholesterol. And then all the feel-good chemicals in the brain, well, a lot of them depend on cholesterol in their receptors. So cholesterol also helps us feel good, makes us cheerful. So it has many, many roles in the body, and it turns out that there's really not very much cholesterol in the plaque. What's in the plaque is mostly calcium, which hardens the arteries, is calcium getting into the wrong places. But they didn't want to blame calcium because the dairy industry was, you know, too powerful for that. So they picked on the animal fats, which didn't have a strong lobbying presence. You can see what's happened. Well, and so for the women listening to the podcast, so we're talking about fat, we started the podcast by talking about lard and like injecting lard into meat and like wrapping, <laughs> <laughs> wrapping, wrapping meat with fat, lard, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all that kind of stuff. And so there's a lot of people who are just like, well, if I eat that much fat, it's going to raise my cholesterol and then it's going to make me more likely to have a heart attack or heart disease and that kind of thing. Because that's what we're told. And for anyone who has received a diagnosis of high cholesterol, uh, their doctor promptly instructs them to cut out the animal fat. So how do yeah. you address that 
um, okay. fat phobia thing. Okay, well, first and foremost, even the most ardent promoters of the cholesterol theory, starting with Ansel Keynes, admitted that the cholesterol we eat has nothing to do with the cholesterol levels in our bodies. If we eat a lot of cholesterol, our bodies don't have to work so hard at making it. And what raises cholesterol into what they call elevated cholesterol is a lot of conditions. For example, if you a lot of stress, your body increases its production of cholesterol so you can make stress hormones. People with thyroid problems tend to have cholesterol levels a little higher. So the cholesterol you eat has absolutely no relationship with the cholesterol level in your blood. At the, by the same token, the cholesterol level in your blood has very little relationship with your tendency to have a heart attack. In fact, what they found is that for women of all ages and for men over the age of 60, the higher your cholesterol, the longer you live. Mm -hmm. Now, for men under the age of 60, there is a slight correlation between cholesterol levels and proneness to heart attack. But there's also a correlation between low cholesterol and cancer. So you can lower your cholesterol using all these really toxic drugs, and that will make you more susceptible to cancer, also digestive disorders, depression, suicide. So it's not a very nice trade-off. Well, and I think it's especially for women who are looking to improve their menstrual cycle health. You know, a lot of women listening to the show either recently came off of hormonal contraceptives or are somewhere in that process of transitioning to understanding their cycles. A huge part of it when you start looking at your cycles, especially if you have a history of hormonal contraceptive use, is that they're kind of all over the place. And that's what we would expect because it takes a bit of time for that to level out. One of the challenges, I think, for a lot of women is trying to be healthy in this day and age where the internet literally just tells you the opposite thing. So one right. website tells you the fat, the other website tells you the fat's going to cause all these problems. But at the end of the day, what these women need to know is how to improve their hormonal health, their hormonal balance, their hormonal production so that they can have healthy cycles, healthy fertility. And so what do you say to that? Well, I say we need to give the body the tools it needs to make hormones. Your body knows how to make them in the right proportions at the right time of your cycle. We don't know how to do that very well, but your body knows. But it needs the tools, and the key tool for that is the animal fats, giving the body plenty of cholesterol and also vitamin A, which your body needs to make all of these hormones. And vitamin A is found, again, uniquely in animal fats and organ meats like liver, the very foods we're being told not to eat. You know, I, I think I probably said this in the first podcast we did, but in my talk, I have a little riddle I say, which is, how are animal fats like sex? And the answer is, you need both for reproduction. You mm -hmm. need sex for reproduction, and you need animal fats for reproduction. You cannot be fertile without the animal fats. So for the gals coming off of the pill or, you know, any of these hormonal treatments, I would say a stick of butter a day, six egg yolks a day, and eat liver a couple times a week. And I think you'll find that things will stabilize themselves very well with that. Well, and let's talk specifically about animal fats for a while and why animal fats are different. So we could start with kind of the saturated and then maybe go to fish fats. But I think there's just a lot of misinformation, lots of misunderstanding. So let's start with what's the difference between, say, cooking with butter or lard versus cooking with coconut oil? They're both saturated fats. Right. right. So let's start there. Well, okay. Actually, butter and lard are a little more stable than coconut oil uh, because the coconut oil burns at a lower temperature. But coconut oil is a plant oil, and although there's nothing wrong with coconut oil, it shouldn't be your only oil because it's not going to give you cholesterol. It's not going to give you vitamin A. Lard is a great source of vitamin D and vitamin K, which are critical for reproduction. None of that's in coconut oil. There's also a very important fat that we get exclusively from animal fats. It's called arachidonic acid. It's an omega-6 fatty acid that we get from animal fats, and it is critical for digestion to make sure that we absorb foods properly. It's also critical for healthy skin, and I'm sure it has a role in fertility as well. It's very important for the way your cells fit together. 
So there's a whole list of things that are in animal fats that you don't get from the plant oils, even a healthy plant oil like coconut oil. Well, and so one of the things that I hear a lot, I get some angry vegan comments on some of my posts, as you can imagine. They're so angry, Sally. Yeah, I know. Well, they're, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have enough cholesterol. <laughs> but one of the points that I often get blasted on some of my articles is we don't need to eat cholesterol because we make all the cholesterol that we need. I think that's true for some people, but certainly not all people. And when you are pregnant, you need a lot more cholesterol because that cholesterol is needed to form the brain and the digestive tract of the infant. And I think this is a reason a lot of people miscarry because the body just doesn't have enough cholesterol and vitamin A and vitamin D, vitamin K, et cetera, to form the fetus properly. Well, I wouldn't mind taking a little tangent and talking a little bit more about cholesterol. I know you mentioned that cholesterol is in every cell in the body and it's required mm -hmm. for our hormone production. Yes. Uh, but to, to kind of give a sense for the women who are trying to conceive or who are kind of recently pregnant or listening in at some stage of their pregnancy, what is the role of cholesterol in fetal development? Yes. Yeah, so the fetus does make its own cholesterol and the child does not make cholesterol. You can't make cholesterol until you're older. And yet, these are the times when the most cholesterol is needed to form the cells, especially to form the brain, which is really high in cholesterol. And then your intestinal tract is also very high in cholesterol. And the stories I hear about children who are born and, you know, they can't eat anything, they have all these terrible food sensitivities. Invariably, when I ask their moms, what kind of diet did you have? They say, oh, I had a low-fat diet. I had low fat all during my pregnancy. And so the baby was just not getting enough of cholesterol to form everything properly. Just going back to the vegan mom, vegans tend to have very low cholesterol. Well, and so if you're not eating foods that contain cholesterol, then can you tell us a little bit about how our body compensates for that? Yes, well, we can make cholesterol. Your liver makes cholesterol. I think it would put a kind of strain on the liver because the liver has to do all that work. But yes, we, we do make cholesterol ourselves. And that just shows you how important it is in the body. Mm -hmm. Same with saturated fats. The body prefers that if you eat saturated fats, but saturated fats are so important that your body has a backup plan and it can make saturated fats out of carbohydrates if you don't eat enough saturated fat. So, and same with cholesterol. If you eat cholesterol, that's great. Uh, if you are not bringing in the cholesterol, then your body does have this backup plan. Yeah, like you mentioned, then your liver has the ability to make it, but obviously your liver is a, a busy you yeah, know, the body, so then so it has to put something else off to make the cholesterol. Exactly. It has so many other important things to do, like detoxification and stuff. <laughs> you know, why put it to all the work to make cholesterol when you can just eat cholesterol? And by the way, for the vegans, I would say vegetarians, I would very much caution you against trying to have a baby if you're a vegan. But if you want to do a lacto-ovo-vegetarianism and get plenty of butter and cream, whole milk, eggs, and hopefully a little fish, cod liver oil, you can do it. The one danger is zinc deficiency because most best sources of zinc are liver, red meat, and shellfish. Real, if you say, I'm just not going to eat red meat, there's still a way to do this in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad that you just told us a little bit about the difference between animal fat and other fats. So it's kind of helpful to have that in mind, that there is a difference between the the nutrient content of the fat. And it's interesting because when you read your book, Nourishing Fats, it, it gives us that sense that fat is a source of nutrition. And I feel like yes. that's a different, we never think of it, fat as a potential source of nutrition. Exactly. We don't think, in fact, I talk about this, the USDA talks about fat as empty calories. Yeah. And so they say whole milk, you shouldn't drink whole milk because it's all these empty calories in the fat. And you have all these calories and they're empty. And this is just so wrong. They're just, they're not empty calories. They're very important calories with lots of nutrients in them. Mm -hmm. And from animal sources. So then to talk a little bit about because I know a lot of, you know, a lot of women will kind of switch over to coconut oil when they learn about the inflammatory properties of the industrial seed oils and things like yes. that. So maybe we could talk a little bit about those industrial fats. <laughs> it is interesting in the book you talk about you give a really like clear and thorough description of how these fats are produced, which is really interesting. 
Yeah. Okay. Yes. So that's chapter two in the book. And by the way, if you can skip that chapter if it's too technical for you, but I felt like it should be in there. It's a chapter with all the diagrams. So the seed oils are tend to be liquid, and that means that they're polyunsaturated. The polyunsaturated fat molecules are very wiggly, and they don't pack together easily, so they make a liquid rather than a solid. And the thing about these polyunsaturates is that they are very fragile, and when they're heated, they start to break down into what's called free radicals, and eventually they break down into these little very reactive molecules called aldehydes. One of the aldehydes is formaldehyde. Okay, so, and you do not want these aldehydes in your body. They initiate the buildup of plaque in the arteries. They cause cancer. I mean, they're just really bad, bad actors in your body. And the industry knew that from the beginning. They knew that these polyunsaturated oils were very dangerous when they were heated. And the process of getting these oils out of the seeds requires five heatings, high heatings, before they even put these oils in the bottle in that plastic bottle, okay? See, what comes out of the seed when they press it out of the seed is this black, smelly, sticky gunk. And then it has to go through all these processes so it looks like an oil. So from the very beginning, the industry knew that these oils were unstable, that they caused cancer. They're really bad news. So then they figured out how to harden these oils by the process called partial hydrogenation. And they thought that that was the solution to everything, that the partially hydrogenated oils were stable and they weren't going to cause cancer. The way I look at this is that the liquid oils, they've been heated many times. They're full of these breakdown products. They're very, very reactive. They cause uncontrolled reactions all over your body. So that might show up as lots of wrinkles or it might show up as plaque buildup in the arteries, or it might show up as cancer. The partially hydrogenated oils are not reactive. In fact, they inhibit reactions in the body. So that might show up as blocking the insulin receptors and giving you diabetes. It might show up as blocking detoxifying enzymes, and so you would get cancer. Well, what's happened is that we found out that the trans fats are really bad, the partially hydrogenated trans fats, and they've been taken out of the food supply now. And we're sort of back to square one with the liquid oils, which they can manipulate in certain ways to make them appear, to make them more solid. But you're still using these very fragile, reactive, rancid oils, and they have ways of making them smell good and seem fresh, but these oils are all rancid. So we like to say we've gone from the frying pan to the fire. Uh, We've gone from the trans fats back to the liquid oils, and we're just going to see more and more cancer from this. Now, the animal fats are very different. They're very stable. They don't break down into these reactive particles. I've just actually an hour ago reading a new paper on this. The saturated fats are the safest and most stable fats for heating, for cooking or frying. The monounsaturated fats, which are in olive oil, they're second best. But the really dangerous ones are the liquid oils. And, you know, as I said, they're heated five times in processing. And then we're told to cook with them. Well, and as someone who used to cook with those types of oils, you know, I grew up cooking with those types of oils, like a lot of people. And then I, you know, I moved over to olive oil and all of that. But what I noticed just visually is that it doesn't take much for them to start smoking. Exactly. Whereas when you switch to cooking with lard or cooking with butter or coconut oil, it doesn't smoke as quickly. Like you really have to cook it for a while before it smokes. Exactly. Exactly. One of the things that I found interesting was your description of the types like tropical plants and so that to, just to kind of give some I guess like a, an example of the structure of these oils and you know why tropical plants typically like coconuts or you know palm trees and things like that have these saturated fats and how it actually gives structure to the cells of the plant. Exactly. So let me start by saying, you know, you've seen advertisements where your arteries are your arteries, yes, are compared to pipes. And you'll see somebody pour some fat down a sink. And of course, that clogs up the pipes. And so the arteries are compared to pipes. Well, the arteries are not like pipes at all. But the one thing I like to point out there is that the temperature in your arteries is tropical. It's 98 degrees. It's very hot tropical day. 
<laughs> and and the tropic saturated fats are liquids. So what you're actually putting in your body in your body is a liquid. And so the unsaturated oils, which are still oils in the cold climates, are like going off the wall. They're so warm, whereas the saturated fats are in just the right environment to, to work properly. And this is the same with plants. Plants in the tropics have more saturated fat because they're warm. And if they were unsaturated fats, the plants just wouldn't work there. They would kind of get wilted and limp. Whereas with saturated fats in their cellulose in their cells, the plants still have structure. Now, a cold-blooded animal or plants in the very cold regions have a lot of unsaturated fats in them, especially one called omega-3. And that's an extremely unsaturated fat, and that's what you're going to get out of cold water fish or out of uh, things like flaxseed, uh, these cold, even soybeans, which is a cold climate plant have omega-3. So that's what you're going to get from cold-blooded animals or plants from cold climates. Well, and let's talk a little bit about the omega-3 fats because there's so much advertising and so many products, even food, real food products. So there's so many, you know, chia seeds and flax seeds, and there's so many, much advertising for plant-based, you know, omega-3s. So I feel like there's a lot of women that, that feel that they're the same, that they're getting the same type of omega-3 from a chia seed, you know, mixture or a flax seed yeah. that yes, they are right. from fish. Yes, a very good point there. Well, first of all, let me say, you know how we are in America and also in Canada, we t- kind of take things to extremes. Now, there was a book published a number of years ago which talked about the importance of having a balance between omega-6 and omega-3. You didn't want too much of either, and you wanted to be in balance. And that book was called Nourishing Traditions. (laughs) That was the first book to talk about this balance. Well, what's happened is people get it about the omega-6s, and they stop doing the vegetable oils. But then they're kind of overdosing on omega-3s and taking too much flax oil or just getting too many sources of omega-3s. And that's just as dangerous as too much omega-6. We only need these omega-6s and omega-3s in very tiny amounts, especially as when you're eating plenty of saturated fat, you can serve these polyunsaturates in your tissues where they belong and you just don't need a lot of them. Now, there is a big difference between the omega-3s in plants and the omega-3s in fish and organ meats. In plants, they are what's called the parent omega-3. They are shorter molecule. These have use. They're important in our cell membranes, but the ones that um, are really important for neurological function are the elongated ones, and I'm sure you've heard these words EPA, but especially DHA. DHA is an omega-3 that's a much larger molecule. And we get that from the animal foods, not from the plant foods. And maybe you could just speak to especially the role in like beetle development. Like why is that important for fertility and especially for moms who are planning to have babies? Yes, the DHA is very important for fertility in many ways. And you definitely need to get that DHA in your cod liver oil or liver or fish to have a healthy baby. But same token, you need the elongated omega-6, arachidonic acid, to balance the omega-3, and that comes from the animal fats. So you actually need both of these things. Mm -hmm. Well, and one of the topics that I wanted to broach with you while I have you here for the interview is vitamin A, because this is a topic that comes up in my client work quite a bit, because there's so much, just all of this conflicting information about it. So in your book, you highlight that And I know this because my like one generation ago, my parents grew up eating liver and my dad, I think I spoke about this on the show before, but my dad, his family had a butcher shop and that was their business. And so he grew up eating all of the things he would eat the brain and the heart and the lungs and the liver and all that stuff. And then they took their cod liver all the time. My parents gave me cod liver a little bit less than they had it a lot less actually. So for me, it's not that foreign. But so when you talk about in your book that, you know, early 1900s and before it was just a common thing to give children cod liver oil and to eat liver. And the book had a liver and organ meat chapter, that same (laughs) cookbook (laughs) that that I was referencing earlier. And so somehow we've gotten to the point now where doctors are telling women not to eat any liver and not to take any cod liver oil. So let's talk about that. (laughs) 
Yes, this is really a shame. We actually had an article in the Weston A. Price Foundation journal called Vitamin A, the Scarlet Vitamin. <laughs> because So vitamin A was the first vitamin to be discovered. It was discovered in butter and egg yolks. And then they found it in cod liver oil. And they found that vitamin A protected against blindness and night blindness and that it protected against infection. Those were the first two things that they figured out for vitamin A. So you, you have to remember, this is before the Second World War, there were no antibiotics, and people were very concerned about things like measles and infectious disease, especially people living in crowded conditions. So the other thing they, so the cod liver oil was given to all these children to protect them against infection, which it did very well. Just to give you an example, there were studies showing that people who took cod liver oil had much less absenteeism in the workplace because of colds and flu. People ate liver. They ate liver at least once a week because the doctors told them to eat liver to prevent anemia. And at the same time, they were getting plenty of vitamin A. Well, a campaign against vitamin A started in the 50s kind of subtle at first, we don't need it, or we can get it from green leafy vegetables. And then in 1995, a paper came out saying that vitamin A caused birth defects. And that was the real blow to vitamin A. And that paper was highly flawed and contradicted several other papers out there that showed that vitamin A prevented birth defects. We know what vitamin A does in the development of the fetus. Vitamin A is this, we call it the concert master of fetal development. Vitamin A tells the stem cells which cells to become. If you don't have enough vitamin A in your system when you get pregnant and then all through that pregnancy, that baby cannot develop normally. And what we're concerned about until even 15 years ago, there was true vitamin A in the prenatal vitamins. So even if you weren't eating liver, at least you were getting vitamin A in the prenatals. And now that's been taken out. And by that, you mean retinol? A retinol was in the prenatal vitamins. Now they put carotenes in, and the carotenes are converted with great difficulty, and half of all women cannot convert carotenes into vitamin A at all. Well, before you continue, I just want, just for the listener's benefit, to be really clear on the difference, because I get this question a lot you know, I eat a lot of carrots. So yeah, can I, I know. like, I'm Real getting, I'm getting a. enough yeah. vitamin A. So maybe yeah. just to clarify that difference. You know, the allies had developed radar and they were able to see the German airplanes at night. And they put out this story that their pilots were eating lots of carrots. <laughs> <laughs> so they had good eyesight. And so that kind of perpetuated this myth that you can get vitamin A from carrots. So what's in carrots and green leafy vegetables and orange fruit are the carotenes which have a role in the body. I mean, they're useful in our bodies, but they're not the true vitamin A. To make vitamin A from carotene, you actually have to split the molecule in half and add an oxygen molecule. So it's a very difficult reaction in the body and takes a lot of energy and enzymes. And as I said, some people are completely missing these enzymes. So you really can't rely on the plant forms, the carotenes, for adequate vitamin A. And Weston Price, in his studies of traditional cultures, found that they had 10 times more true vitamin A in their diets than modern people. And all of the foods they considered sacred and important for having healthy babies were extremely rich in vitamin A. So science has corroborated um, you know, these practices in traditional people. You need plenty of vitamin A to have a healthy baby. Well, and I think it's interesting what you said regarding having the vitamin A supply even before you conceive, because, you know, as a mom, it it astonished me when I got pregnant and the heart is beating already when you're like five or six weeks pregnant and five or six weeks sounds like a long time. But for those women who are charting their cycles and totally get what I'm about to say, when you're five weeks pregnant, that's three weeks after you've ovulated. (laughs) Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's before. So that's because they count week one as the week of your period, assuming a 28 day cycle. And so, really? yes. Really? <laughs> so by the time you're five weeks pregnant, it's literally three weeks after you've ovulated. So for many women, as you can imagine, Sally, if you're not charting your cycles, many women are pregnant and they don't know it at that point because, you know, maybe their period isn't really that late yet. Yes, right, right. And by then the baby's heart is already beating and vitamin A plays a critical role in fetal heart development and a thousand other things. 
Yes. And that's why now, you know, in the traditional cultures, they had a six-month period of preparation, of nutritional preparation before conception. And during that period, they ate liver and butter from grass-fed animals and egg yolks and all these things full of vitamin A to get ready for pregnancy. And we don't do that. So it's just kind of hit or miss. And if the baby's heart doesn't form properly because the mom is deficient in vitamin A, she has a miscarriage. Or she has a baby, she, a baby's born with a defect in the heart. Well, and then the, the challenge then for women who are trying to do the best thing for their babies is that the internet is full of information saying that vitamin A causes birth defects. <laughs> Did you want to speak to that? Well, I'm sure that very high levels of vitamin A do cause birth defects, but very high levels of almost anything will cause a birth defect. We're not advocating really high levels. We advocate taking cod liver oil to provide 20,000 units of vitamin A, plus your other vitamin A rich foods. And this has to be balanced with plenty of vitamin D and vitamin K, because all these three vitamins work together. I can tell you the beautiful, healthy babies born to our moms who follow this advice is, you know, is proof. Well, this is the way to go. So I've, you know, I've been particularly interested in, in vitamin A. And so I was looking into the research and I found a study that basically compared the effects of synthetic vitamin A. So mm -hmm. taking a pill form of vitamin A versus women actually eating liver. And they monitored how the vitamin A was metabolized in these women, you know, comparatively. Yeah. And so what they found in the study was that the synthetic A was metabolized in a much different way. And yes. these women had a much higher level of these harmful uh, metabolites yes. that are associated with tetragenic effects, yes. so birth defects. So I think as well, the difference between like this whole issue with birth defects is related to supplemental A, so synthetic forms of A. Possibly, or not getting enough because they're getting carotenes instead. You know, I think I've heard of this study. I think I've actually seen this study, but if you would send it to me, I'd like to look at it again. Yeah, no, definitely. And I'll, I'll link it in the show notes for any of our listeners who want to okay. see more. So there was something else that I wanted to ask you about with vitamin A in the book. And it's just because, I don't know, maybe I just love strong statements. I like your writing style, Sally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to read this little section here. So vitamin A is also involved in the conversion of cholesterol into sex hormones, which we talked about, estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, DHEA, and many others. Without it, expect infertility, erectile dysfunction, and problems of endocrine dysfunction, such as fibroid tumors and endometriosis. So I thought that that was a pretty strong statement because there's a lot of women that struggle with endometriosis. And so you're pointing to a link between vitamin A deficiency, essentially, and some of these yes. infertility problems. Yes. And what is endometriosis? It's like, you know, your tissue is confused, doesn't know what to be or where to, mm -hmm. where to be. And that's of always vitamin A deficiency. Vitamin A gets those cells straightened out, tells the stem cells what to do and what to become. And without it, yes, you're going to see a lot of confusion in the tissues, which is what endometriosis really is. In fact, I think I talk about a study out of South Africa where they gave women with fibroids and endometriosis 90,000 units of vitamin A per day. And it was 100% successful in uh, curbing these conditions. And we don't recommend taking that much for any length of time, but we have had our own reports of women. In fact, there was a gal who called me who had had painful menstrual cycles for 20 years and had really tried everything. She was desperate. And I said, well, try this. Uh, take three tablespoons of cod liver oil for a few weeks and see what happens. And she called me back and she said, I just had my first normal menstrual cycle in my life from taking all this cod liver oil. Well, isn't that, yeah, that phrase why I noted it, because it, it really struck me. And what you said just now about vitamin A really directing the cells of what to do is very interesting. And back to our conversation about animal fats, I mean... One of the questions I asked you, what differentiates animal fats from other types of fats, plant fats? And, you know, one of the things that you mentioned is that it actually does contain vitamin A, yes, vitamin D. Yes, yes. Yeah, these are stored in the fats and organ meats of the animals. Very little really in the meat, the actual lean meat, which of course is what most people eat. And just like take chicken, for example, there's virtually no vitamin A in the skinless chicken breast. But if you eat the wing with the dark meat and the skin, you'll get lots of vitamin A. 
Well, so let's talk a little bit about the practicality of this then. So for the listeners who are intrigued, we've piqued their interest. What are some of the ways that we can go about incorporating these animal fats into our diet and make sure that we are getting these great nutrients in the fats? Well, first and foremost, use butter. Whatever you're putting on your vegetables and your bread and your crackers, throw that away and and use butter. (laughs) And if it's grass-fed butter, it's going to be higher in these really important nutrients. So we urge people to use grass-fed butter. Uh, Eggs, don't be afraid of eggs. And the most important part of the egg is the yellow, the yolk of the egg. That's where all the fat-soluble vitamins are and that's where all the fats are. So this is a really delicious diet, actually. You can put butter on everything. You can cook in butter. You can eat plenty of eggs, whole dairy. Cheese, of course, is my favorite food. Uh, That's a wonderful food. It's got the fats and the vitamins and calcium and everything all in one delicious package. And I would say to moms, learn to eat liver in some form. I personally love chicken liver pate. I have no problem eating it. Uh, some people like liver worse. Some people like liver and onions. Uh, we're going to have, my husband and I are going to have liver and onions tonight for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Take cod liver oil. There's another way of eating liver. And if you really can't get yourself to eat liver, uh, you can take a desiccated liver in capsules. And four of those is like an ounce of liver. And if you take those every day, you're getting plenty of liver. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's a lot different, I think, for women who didn't grow up eating liver. I think it's a big challenge. So for someone like me, I grew up eating liver. I didn't have an issue incorporating it. It was fairly simple for me. Had I known how beneficial it would be for me, you know, I wouldn't incorporated it sooner. I just... Yes. You know, (laughs) see, I grew up never eating liver. I never ate liver till I went to France and ate pâté. And when I had that first bite of pâté, I almost went crazy. It was like my body said, this is what you've needed and looking back in my, especially my teenage years, I realized I was very vitamin A deficient. I had a lot of symptoms of vitamin A deficiency. So I think I'm a person who needs a lot of vitamin A. And this is even though I, I ate eggs and butter and had whole milk, but I never ate liver, you see. So I was very fortunate in that I discovered pate, ate lots of liver before my, I had my first child because she was very healthy. Um, but she wouldn't have been if I hadn't gone to France and discovered pate. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's interesting because for women who are concerned about vitamin A toxicity, then when you talk about eating liver, there, we, you know, we hyper-focus on the vitamin A in the liver. But when you look at the nutrient profile of liver, whether it's chicken or beef liver, duck liver, whatever type of liver, it's not a vitamin A pill that we're taking, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> no, no, you're taking a complete package, including folate. It's the best source of folate there is. Uh, B12, which you absolutely need to have a healthy baby. B6, cal- uh, phosphorus, all the minerals, iron. I mean, liver is just a powerhouse. It, and the poultry liver, I think, is really the best. It has the A and D in it as well as the vitamin A. Well, and especially for the women who are coming off of hormonal contraceptives, you know, one of the things I always say is that there's a lot of research that shows us what types of nutrients are depleted when you're taking hormonal contraceptives, right? And it just so happens that like what is depleted, if you were to put a list of all the nutrients that are depleted and all the nutrients in liver, like it's almost like they were, it's like a match made in heaven. (laughs) Well, that's another a very good reason to to eat liver to restore fertility for sure. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's what I, I was trying to remember what I was going to ask you. So, you know, a lot of women have trouble with dairy products and maybe have a sensitivity to eggs and things like that. So for women who have those types of challenges, what advice would you want to give to them? Well, first of all, I would try whole dairy with the fat in it. I think you'd find that less allergenic. And of course, I'm the raw milk lady. And I know I almost hate to say that for a Canadian audience because it's so hard for you to get raw milk. But in the States, it's pretty easy to get. And we've, we did a survey found that 82% of people diagnosed as lactose intolerant could, eat, uh, could consume raw milk without any problem whatsoever. Yeah, no, that it's very interesting. And I actually was able to find a source for raw milk through the Weston A. Price Foundation. So my family has benefited from raw milk for several years now. Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. Your children will grow up tall on the raw milk. (laughs) I have three grandsons growing up on cod liver oil and raw milk. And oh, boy, these are beautiful children. And they're all really tall for their age. 
Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Well, you know what, Sally, we have covered so much <gasps> ground here. I really appreciate you taking us through your book and also letting me go through and kind of ask you all these little questions about it and through the different parts that were particularly interesting to me. Based on the conversation that we had today, what would you want our listeners to most take from our conversation? Eat butter. <laughs> butter is a health food. <laughs> yeah, and just uh, for your listeners, that book is Nourishing Fats. And I will say that I tried to make it readable, very reader-friendly. And, you know, my other book is the Nourishing Traditions book of baby and child care, which a lot of this material we talked about today is also in that book. Yeah, two great resources that, that I often recommend and refer just because, you know, it's, it's a different way of looking at food. And one of the things that I said, I believe, in our first interview was that one of the things that the Weston Price Foundation has done essentially for the world is to make us start thinking about food as a source of nutrition as opposed yes. to just a source of fuel or calories yes. or whatever the case is. Exactly. It's much more than that. Yeah. And the importance of those nutrients for for pregnancy and fertility specifically. Yes. Well, thank you so much for being here, Sally. You shared the, the titles of your book and what is your main website that people can go for more information? Oh, okay. About you? Well, the Weston A. Price Foundation is WestonAPrice.org, W-E-S-T-O-N-A-P-R-I-C-E.org. And there's a lot of articles under children's health, you know, reflect what we talked about today. I urge your listeners to become members and join our Weston Price family and receive our journal and participate in all the activities that we do. We do have a very large chapter system, local chapter system that helps you find these nutrient dense foods in your area. I will put links uh, that we've spoken about here in the show notes so that the listeners don't have to run and try to write all that down. But I just want to thank you so much for coming back to the show, Sally. It was a great interview and I'm really happy that we were able to share this information with our listeners. Thank you. By the way, I also have a blog, which is nourishingtraditions.com. Okay, perfect. I will add that to the list. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode at fertilityfriday.com 172. I hope that you enjoyed my interview with Sally. As you could tell, I was really excited to talk about her book, Nourishing Fats. I found her book to be really interesting in a number of different ways, and she included a lot of really interesting examples that highlighted the difference between historically how uh, you know we ate as a, as a nation, as a culture, uh, and, and how we eat now. And as I alluded to in the podcast episode, you know, for me, it's, it's really not that far back. For me, it's only um, you know, a generation because my parents very much ate this way growing up on an island in the West Indies, a lot of the same ways that she describes uh, in her book for how people used to eat a couple generations ago, that's pretty much how my parents ate. And so for me, it, it's so present. Whereas for many of you, it, it might be several generations back that you'd actually have to go to find out how, you know, how your great or great, great grandparents used to eat. So it's really interesting to, to see the power of advertising and how uh, essentially the changes to our diet and the changes to the types of fat that we consume on a regular basis was very much driven by by marketing and by certain companies that were trying to sell us certain products. And so it, it's so questionable when you think about it from that perspective that so much of what we eat and so much of what we believe about food is essentially something that an advertiser has told us because they're trying to sell a product. So I feel like it's very, it's kind of in your face when you uh, read the history in Sally's book because she kind of points out this progression and when you take a step back and think about how we got from where we started. I can't get over that 1896 cookbook where they're injecting fat into the meat for flavor and everything was covered in cream and everything was cooked in lard and there were very little vegetables to speak of. And I think Sally makes a comment in the book that it was like the vegetables seemed like just an excuse for sauce. Uh, but it was just such a different menu and looking, I mean, it looked delicious. So I was, you know, looking at those meals thinking, wow, I wonder what that would taste like. But at the same time, you have to wonder how we got from that there to where we are now, where people don't even want to put a little bit of butter in the pot to cook some vegetables. So how did we go so far from there? One of the takeaways from the interview today is just the idea that, you know, animal fats 
can be a source of nutrition, right? So thinking about fat, an actual legitimate source of nutrients, nutrients that we need in order to be healthy. And so Sally talked about arachidonic acid, we talked about vitamin E, and we didn't talk a whole lot about vitamin D and K, but those are all nutrients that are found in animal fats. And those are things that are not found in plant foods. And so even our discussion about cholesterol. So I think that that's a really important one, especially when you're looking to restore your fertility to really understand how your body makes hormones it's really helpful. <laughs> so it's really helpful to know that in order for your body to make hormones, it needs to start with cholesterol. And so cholesterol is the precursor to all of our steroid hormones. So that includes our hormones, progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, cortisol, you know, to name a few. And so without cholesterol, we're not making those hormones, understanding how our body makes hormones and understanding what the raw materials are that our body needs to achieve that I think is very very important and it also helps to kind of get our heads around how important it is to to make sure we're eating the right kinds of fat a couple other points you know that stand out to me are just the differences between say animal sources of certain things versus plant sources so for instance animal sources of omega-3 fatty acids so fish for example fish, fish oil, cod liver oil, and the fats in the fish themselves versus the omega-3 fats in things like chia seeds and flax seeds. I think it's really helpful to know that they're different because a lot of the information out there makes it seem like they're the same, they're doing the same things. And that, you know, lends itself to the conversation about vitamin A because a lot of people think that you're getting vitamin A from from carrots and from kale and from green and brightly colored vegetables and what you're getting is beta carotene and so it's in the literature it's in the research and there is a difference between beta carotene and retinol so they call it you know the color the retinol is the colorless vitamin a and then the beta carotenes from plant sources obviously have that kind of characteristic yellow orangey color and so it's really important to just to know that those things are different and to know that you're not getting retinol, you're not getting that vitamin A from plant foods. So to know that they're different and that they act differently in the body and your body does need retinol. And so if it's not getting that from animal foods, then it has to make it and we're not necessarily that great at converting it. And that leads itself to another important takeaway from the show, which is just to really start thinking about prenatal nutrition. You know, what do you need to build a healthy baby? And why is it important to actually be well established in those nutrients and to have good stores built up before you even start trying to have a baby? So that's something that's extremely important, especially when you're coming off of hormonal contraceptives. You know, one of the things that our culture just encourages women to do is really just to come off the pill or whatever hormonal contraceptive and immediately start trying to have a baby. And although we're all in different places in life, and so I, the decision of when to start a family is a personal one, and no one can tell you when to do that or when is the best time to do that. The challenge is that Hormonal contraceptives are known to deplete a number of key nutrients. And so when you're coming off of hormonal contraceptives and going straight into trying for a baby, you may get pregnant. Your risk of miscarriage is a little bit higher when you immediately come off of hormonal contraceptives. But ultimately, going into pregnancy in a nutrient deficient state is not the best case scenario because at the end of it, as I, as I always say, we're all concerned, of course, about the health of your baby, but we also need to be concerned about the health of mom because at the end of your pregnancy, you're going to have a healthy baby that needs to be taken care of. And so going into pregnancy in a nutrient deficient state is really not the best scenario for, for mom or baby because baby has to pull those nutrients from somewhere. And so if you didn't have enough coming into it, then you're gonna end up even more deficient. And that can come out on the other side with you not necessarily having all of the energy and vitality that you need to take care of your new baby. So it's a big conversation, lots of serious topics, but it's important to really think about that. So one of the reasons I do this podcast is just to kind of give information and just to kind of put that out there so that you can be thinking about that thinking about food differently, thinking about food as nutrition and thinking about going into pregnancy intentionally and really doing what you can to build up your nutrient stores well before you ever start to try to conceive. 
So just a reminder, if you are wanting to jump into my 10 week fertility awareness mastery group program, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash group program for more information and for how to apply. And I just want to thank you for taking the time to hang out with me today for listening to the show and supporting the show. I really appreciate all of you for taking the time and including me in your day. So I know some of you take me on road trips. I know I've got a few emails from you who have discovered the podcast and are going on like a super long road trip and will go ahead and, you know, download a bunch of episodes to binge listen. I know some of you uh, take me on your commutes to work and out exercising or uh, going to the gym or doing housework. And so I really appreciate all of you for taking the time to listen to the show and for supporting the show. If you haven't joined the Fertility Friday Facebook community, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash community and uh, jump in there. And we will be uh, chatting about this episode since it is now live. So thanks again. I hope you have an amazing day, an amazing weekend. And as always, be well and happy charting. Happy charting.